Let the word come on. 
And they come in after tradition that man has set in place. After the rudiments of the world. After the rudiments of the world. And not after Christ. And not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. For in Christ dwelleth all, all things. Yes. All things. Not some, but all of them. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. And ye are complete in him. And you are complete in Christ. Which is the head of all principalities and powers. Which is the head of all principalities and powers. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision. Also you have been circumcised with the circumcision. Made without hand. Made without hand. In putting off the body of the sin of the flesh. So we are putting off the body of the sins of the flesh. By the circumcision of Christ. By the circumcision of Christ. Bear with him in baptism. We are going to bear it with him in baptism. Mm -hmm. Wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. So then we are risen through the operation of God. Who have raised him from the dead. And God raised Jesus from the dead. And you. And you. Being dead in your sins. And the uncircumcision of your flesh. And the uncircumcision of your flesh. Have he quickened together with him. Has he quickened together with him. Having forgiven you all trespasses. And he forgive you of all of your trespasses. Body out the hand writing of ordinances that was against us. He blotted out everything that was against us. Which was contrary to us. Which was not working in our good anyway. And took it out of the way. So Christ took it out of the way. Nailing it to his cross. And he nailed it to the cross. Therefore we don't have any excuses today. Amen. And having four principalities and power. And having or principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly. He made a show of them openly. Triumphing over them in it. Triumphing over them in it. So he's letting us know we have a way out. Amen. And what we're going to talk about today is baptism. What is baptism? Amen. And how important is it? Yes. So the scripture says, see to it that no one take you captive by philosophy, by telling you lies. That's right. And empty deceit according to human tradition, mm -hmm. according to the elementary spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also ye were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. By putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, yes. in which you were also raised with him through faith in the power and the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead, and you who were dead in your trespasses uh -huh. and at the incircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him having forgiven us all our trespasses 
by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This is set aside, nailing it to the cross. So everything that we had done, Jesus nailed it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by being crucified. He gave us another chance. He died that we could have life. Today we focus on the meaning and importance of baptism. The note I want to strike immediately, the note and the truth that I want to set first and foremost is that baptism gets its meaning and its importance from the death of Jesus Christ, Amen. the Son of God. It, and he died in our place and for our sins. And from his triumph over death in the, the resurrection that guarantees our new and everlasting life. Amen. Baptism has meaning and importance only because the death and resurrection of Jesus are infinitely important for our rescue from the wrath of God and our everlasting joy in his glorious presence. That's the note that must be struck first, that Jesus died for you and he rose again that you could have eternal life. And that's what baptism represents. We're not mainly talking about religious rituals. We're not mainly talking about church tradition. We're mainly talking about Jesus Christ and his magnificent work of salvation and dying for our sins and, ra and raising for our justification. He was raised for our justification. Amen. So God want us to know, amen, that the work he did it was for us. Talking about baptism means talking about how Jesus taught us to express our faith in Jesus and his great salvation. So don't have small thoughts as we begin. Have large thoughts. Great thoughts and about great reality. And that reality is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, crucified to bear the sins of millions and raised to give them everlasting life in the new heavens and the new earth. But you've got to do it the way he said. Amen. Now, what we believe about baptism, we believe that baptism is an ordinance of the Lord by which those who have repented, that's the first thing you got to repent. And say that again. We believe that those who have repented and come to faith express their union with Christ in his death and resurrection by being emerged in war in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. It is a sign of belonging to the new people of God, the true Israel and the emblem of burial and cleansing, signifying death to the old and life to the new. Amen. Amen. So let's take five parts of that affirmation and look at the biblical basis for them. One, baptism is an ordinance of God. First, we believe that baptism is an ordinance of God. What we mean by this is that the Lord Jesus commanded it. He ordained it in a way that, the, that would make it an ongoing practice of the church. That didn't mean they did it in the old times and we don't do it now. That means if they did it, we should follow, amen, what Jesus did. 
We find this most explicitly in Matthew 28, 19 through 10, 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Make disciples is the main verb. Having gone, make disciples of all nations. The defining principles are baptizing them and teaching them. So the church is commanded to do this for all disciples. Making disciples of all nations includes baptizing them. And the time frame is defined by the promise of Christ himself in verses 20. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The promise of him is for as long as this age lasts. Amen. So, the com so the command that he promises to help us with is as long as this age lasts. So baptism is a command and orders of the Lord Jesus to be performed in making disciples until Christ returns at the end of the age. Two, baptism expresses union with Christ. Second, baptism expresses union with Christ in his death and resurrection. Amen. The clearest teaching on this is Romans 6, 3 through 4. And we pray that you all are making notes so you can go back and read the scriptures later. Do not, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Where we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. In honor that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Amen. And you've got to be changed before you go into the world. Amen. In the, the wider context of Romans, I think it was, it will be a mistake to say that water baptism is a means of our being united to Christ. In Romans, faith is the means by which we are united to Christ and justified. But we show this faith. We say this faith and signify this faith and symbolize this faith with the act of baptism. Faith unites to Christ, and baptism symbolizes the union. An analogy would be saying, with this ring I be wed. When we say that, we don't mean that the ring or the putting of the ring on the finger is what makes us married. No, it shows the covenant and symbolizes the covenant, but the covenant making vows make the marriage. So it is with faith and baptism. So similarly, Paul said, with this baptism, you are united to Christ. And the point we are focusing on here is that we are united to him in his death and burial and resurrection. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. And all of that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So the imaginary of baptism is death, burial, and resurrection. Christ was buried and raised to new life. In baptism by faith, we are united with Christ in death, burial, resurrection. Baptism dramatically portrays what happened spiritually when we received Christ. Your old self of unbelief and rebellion, idolatry, died. 
and a new you of faith and submission and treasuring Christ came into me. That's what you confess to the world and to heaven when you are baptized. So we want you to understand why you are being baptized. Baptism is immersion in water. It don't mean sprinkling you. But you are to be emerged in the world. Amen? Anybody have any questions on that? Amen. That means that you are emerged. You are put down in the world. Third, we believe that expression of union with Christ in death and resurrection happens by being emerged in the world. The clearest evidence for this are the words of Romans 6, 3 through 4, which describe the act of baptism as burial and rising from the dead. This is not naturally understood to mean that you are buried of the water and then come out from the water to signify rising from the grave. The word baptism in Greek means dip or emerge. And most scholars agree that this is the way the, the early church preached bapt, practice baptism. Only much later does the practice of sprinkling or pouring as far as we can tell from this evidence. There are a few other pointers to emerge besides the being of the word and the imagery of death and burial. In Acts 8, 37 through 38, the Ethiopian eunuch come to faith while riding with Philip in his chariot and says, see here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? Philip agrees and it says he commanded the chariot to stop and they both went down into the water. Philip and the eunuch and he baptized him. That they went down into the water makes most sense if they were going down to emerge him, not to sprinkle him. Similarly, it says in John 3, 23, John also was baptizing near Salem, but water was plentiful there. You don't need plenty, plenty for water if you are simply sprinkled. You just need, amen. You just need a little so there is really very little dispute that this was the way the early church baptized. They did it by emerging the new believers in water and signifying his burial and resurrection with Jesus. Baptism is the uh, Trinitarian name. For baptism means doing this emerging in the name of, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 28 and 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. This means that not just any emerging is baptism. There is a holy appeal to God, the Father, and God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit, to be represented and to act and it make it true and real in what it says about their work in redemption. There is no salvation without the Father the Son, and the Holy Ghost. When we call on their name, we depend upon them and honor them and say that this act is because of them and by them and for them. Baptism is for believers only. Baptism was an expression of faith and therefore only believers did. The key sentence in the Bethlehem affirmation says, we believe that baptism is an ordinance of the 
Lord, by which those who have repented and came to faith express that their union with Christ in his death and resurrection. So our understanding of the New Testament is that the meaning of baptism includes the fact that it is an expression of faith of the one being baptized. It is not something that an unbeliever can do. And let me say that again. It is not something that an unbeliever can do. You must be a believer. Amen. You must be a believer. It is not something that an infant can do. That is why we do not baptize infants. We we go we do the we christen them as babies, and when they become of age, and they can make that decision that they want to live for the Lord, they want to be a believer, or they are a believer. This is when they are baptized. There are several pastors that have been had the greatest influence on me over the years in persuading me of the baptized view. One of the most important is Colossians 2, 11 and 12. In him, which is Christ, also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So Paul speaks of circumcision and may without hands turn. Circumcision today has meaning for the Christian, not as a physical act, but as a spiritual act of Christ in which he cuts away the old sinful body and make us new. It is virtually, it is virtually synonymous with the new birth then he speaks of baptism, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. So the image of spiritual circumcision is closely connected with the image of baptism. We were circumcised, having been baptized, the old body of flesh was cut away in conversion. You died and rose again in baptism. So we're not going to go into the part about the infant because we don't baptize babies here. We do christens. So we sing. And then it say, why does it work? But textually and covenantly, it doesn't work. Look carefully at Colossians 2 and 12. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith. The words through faith are all important on this issue. Paul says that when you come up out of the water, signifying being raised with Christ, this is happening through faith, according to verse 12. In which baptism you were also raised with him through faith. Baptism as a, as a drama of death and resurrection with Christ gets its meaning from the faith that it expresses. In baptism, you are raised with him through faith. So if you're going down and don't have faith, you're going in vain. Paul shows the same way of thinking about baptism and faith in Galatians 3, 26 and 27. In Christ Jesus, you all, you are all sons through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We become sons of God through faith and no other way. Then he says, for connecting this way of becoming sons of God with baptism, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. In other words, you are a new creature now. You're put on the ways of Christ. That explanation with the word for only makes sense 
if baptism is understood as an act of our faith. In Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Or to turn it around, since you were baptized into Christ, therefore we know that in Christ you are all sons of God through faith. Why? Because that is what baptism means. You were baptized into Christ by faith. Baptism without faith, faith was inconvenient to Paul and is still inconvenient today. So we say to you, we want you to know what baptism is about. We don't want to just talk about it, but we want you to understand what you're doing. Because if you think baptism is going to save you, it's not. You need to be saved and be a believer before you go into the water. So we, we hope that you understand that baptism is important. It was uncompromisingly commanded by the Lord Jesus that we do baptism. It was universally administered to Christians entering the early church. It was uniquely connected to conversion as an unrepeatable expression of saving grace. So now after you've heard, amen, we, we want you to think about what you're doing. And know this is the will of God. And know that it's very important to be baptized. And then you should be in a local church before you are baptized. Why? Because you need to be taught the ways of God. And the only way you can do that is by knowing the word of God. Failing to be baptized is serious. Excluding genuine believers from the local church is serious. They are God, they are godly, Bible-believing, Christ-exalting, God-centered followers of Jesus who fail to see the dreadfulness of being, not being baptized as a believer. And they are godly, Bible-believing, Christ-exalting, God sent a followers of Jesus who failed to see the dreadfulness of excluding such people from church membership. The question we should ask is not only hard to answer, but it is hard to formulate. Perhaps the Lord in his mercy will show us how to do both in a way that will cut this knot from his glory. May the Lord grant wisdom that you, we pray that you have wisdom, that you understand that you are becoming one with Christ when you are baptized. So we hope that you understand what baptism is about. Amen. Amen. And we say to our candidates, Read over the scriptures during the week. Know that you've been buried. When you go down, you come up, God help wash these things away. Baptism is necessary. One thing about it, it was started in the early church. Amen. Paul was baptized. Now, Paul, I'm sorry. John was baptized. But Jesus hadn't left yet. So the Holy Ghost hadn't gone there. But now you see it says baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That's the Trinity. And that's the way it's done. Some churches baptize only in the name of the Father and the Son. 
They don't believe in the Trinity. But know the truth, and the truth will make you free.